Hello everyone, this is Alderman Walter Burnett. Uh, welcome back to Network 27. As you all know, Network 27 is a show that we put together to inform people about what's going on in the community as far as resources and opportunities. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. We are now in the month of July. Um, next month we're getting ready to have our annual stay in school picnic um, on August the 23rd. We welcome anyone who wants to volunteer. Uh, we want all of the young people to come. Uh, it's a picnic for the whole family. We have a senior citizen tent where we service the seniors. They don't have to get up. They don't have to stand in line. We make sure that they eat, play bingo, have their own entertainment. Uh, we look to have a lot of entertainment. If anyone is interested in coming and performing, uh, you can talk to some of our volunteers about it. You can call our office at 312-432-1995. So we have food, we give out school supplies, and if we're able to raise enough money, we try and give out some scholarships. Uh, we do it in coordination with Chicago Neighbors United. You can call our office and find out about the website. Our number is 312-432-1995. I also want to thank all of the senior citizens for coming to the Senior Citizen Bingo. I hope you all had a good time. I know I did, had a good time dancing. I'd like to thank all of the elected officials who came and put up some cash for you all to win some money in the bingo. Um, and I wanted to know if you all can contact us and let us know if you all want to do a senior citizen ball, uh, a time when we all can get dressed up and go out and party. Now, uh, if we have a ball, I don't want none of those None of those guys just sitting around and not getting up and dancing. If we, want, if we have a ball and I hire a band and a DJ, I want folks to come and dance. And you all can't fool me because I don't sing some of you all dance. Just because you're a senior citizen don't mean that you can't get down. So I want you all to give us a call and let us know about that. Uh, I know uh, the scenery looks a little different because it is. We're actually uh, at our 27 Ward Superintendent's Office for Streets and Sanitation. Uh, we're here today uh, with our uh, very capable uh, Ward Superintendent, Linda Delgado, uh, and we want to talk to her about uh, what goes on with streets and sanitation, uh, inform people about things that they may already know, and maybe educate folks on things that they don't know. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our ward superintendent, Linda Delgado. How you doing, Ms. Delgado? I'm doing fine, thank you, Alderman. Fantastic. Uh, so Linda, um, I know most people know you. Uh, some may, may, may know you because you probably get them tickets. They probably don't want to know you. Uh, and, and some know you because they call you and to get services uh, in the ward, whether it's for ball pickup, lots being cleaned whatever the case may be. Uh, but Linda, uh, let's tell them who Linda Delgado is. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can talk about Linda Delgado, the ward superintendent. My name is Linda Delgado. I come from a very large family. I was born and raised in the community here. That's how I first met you, Alderman, all those years back. I was born not too far away from uh, the 27th Ward. I. Um, been in city government for a while. I've worked for uh, quite a few departments over the years that I've been in government. I worked for the Corporation Counsel's Office in City Hall. From so that the, was during the Harold Washington? That was during the Harold Washington days, exactly. Um, I was in the Finance Division and uh, at the Corporation Counsel's Office for quite a few years. And from there, I went to the Department of Planning and Development. I was in charge of a lot of the programs that the city has that uh, offered tax incentives to businesses that were expanding or relocating to the city of Chicago. So from there, I went, I've been uh, over at the CTA in the General Counsel's Office. I was the Chief Administrator in the General Counsel's Office for about five or six years. And um, I think that each time you move from one government agency to the next, you get quite, you get a lot more knowledge and not a lot more experience, and you get a maybe a bigger picture of how government works. After I left the CTA, I was over at City Colleges for just for a year. I was their employment manager. I was in charge of uh, the hiring for the seven uh, different city colleges in the district office and the in new 
employee orientation, that kind of thing. So again, you learn a different process there, how teachers are hired, how the staff is hired. And it was while I was there um, that I had an opportunity to interview for the position as ward superintendent for the 27th ward. So I think that coming into that position, I may not have had a lot of experience about sanitation, but I did have a lot of experience about managing staff, about dealing with union and non-union employees, and having a good uh, background in how the city works. Fantastic. So that, that helped to equip you with some of the things, and you learned a lot. So tell me, Linda, uh, you were uh, at that time one of the few uh, female ward superintendents and probably the first uh, Latina uh, war superintendent uh, in the city of Chicago. You want to tell us a little bit about that and how was that? <laughs> you know, that's absolutely true. I, I've been the ward superintendent for nine years and when I first started there were only three other female uh, ward superintendents. I, I think that maybe uh, people don't realize that each elected alderman has a ward superintendent. And so there were 50 aldermen and that's the ratio. There were only three other females and all of them were African American. I was the first Hispanic uh, female ward superintendent in streets and sanitation. I'd like to say that since that time, that was about nine years ago, there are, are a lot more females in the department that are ward superintendents. But I also like the fact that I was the first <laughs> Hispanic uh, ward superintendent within the department. Is it challenging being in a man's world? Absolutely. Without a doubt, it is absolutely challenging. I think that you sometimes have to work twice as hard and be twice as quick on being able to learn things uh, just because of the environment. It's hard, to, I don't want to make it seem like a negative thing, but to some, to some extent, I guess it is a negative thing. But it's better now than it was back then. I think you have, um, more people that are willing to help you, more people that are willing to encourage you to learn things, more people that are willing to listen to you if you have an opinion about th uh, different things. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that was the case all those years back. Fantastic, so. but you overcame it and, um, and now they treat you like you're one of the guys, huh? Yeah, unfortunately sometimes that is exactly it. I am, I'm one of the guys, I'm one of the team. You probably have, and, to, remind, uh, you probably have to remind them that you're a woman sometimes, <laughs> huh? It's, um, it's a much better environment. And, and again, I think uh, Streets and Sands is one of those departments that I don't care how long you're in the department, you learn something new all the time. You, you learn how to do something new, you, you encounter a new problem, you learn how to solve a new problem, and now you know who to reach out to to solve the problems. That's the big thing too, that you have such a great working relationship with the other bureaus that make up uh, the Department of Streets and Sanitation, you know, whether it's SWAP or the um, reentry program that helps you with different things, whether it's uh, the people that deal with the high lifts, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's amazing how many people you've connected with that you put them, pull it all together and you get amazing things done. Fantastic. Amazing things. So, so some of those things that you mentioned may be a little bit over the people's heads. Some folks may know what SWAP and high lifts um, and, and all uh, those things are. But we, we'll get back to that. Why don't you, why don't you give us a, uh, an overview? What does a ward superintendent do? Well, you know, one, one, ward superintendents are on call 24-7. I think that a lot of people think that we have a 6 to 2.30 job. So do you job. all get overtime? We don't get overtime. We don't get comp time. We're on salary, and we do make a good salary. I'm not suggesting that we don't. But we don't get comp time, we don't get overtime, and we are on call 24-7. Uh, when you think about if something happens on the weekend or something happens after hours, say there is an accident and they need a cleanup or say uh, someone encounters somebody that dumps garbage in a certain spot in the ward or uh, anything unique happens, they'll, they'll call us out. It doesn't matter what time it is. If, it's, if someone calls in a dead cat or an animal that got killed and there's nobody to pick it up, they'll actually call the ward superintendents and ask them to go and take care that if it's off hours. Saturday and Sunday Saturday also. and Sunday and, 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 and off hours. And the other things, uh, when you think about all the activities that happen in your ward, there's nothing that we're not responsible for to some extent, whether it's directly or as a conduit. If you have a, a neighborhood festival like this um, 
it's that time of year where every time you blink, there's an, either the Old Town Art Fest or the Taste of Randolph or all these different neighborhood fests happening in the ward. Part of our responsibility is to go out and check and to make sure the garbage dealt, is dealt with appropriately, to make sure that nothing happened during the fest that uh, needs our attention, that kind of thing. If you have um, ice storm, of which we've had many, or, or even a heavy rain like yesterday, you have to check to make sure that there's not flooding, you have backed up sewers, you're calling that kind of information trees, in. Trees, uh, have trees that have fallen. You know, last year in the new part of the ward, we had that microburst that uh, just giant trees fell all up and down uh, Monroe between Hoyne and Levitt. It looked like it, an obstacle course. There were so many fallen trees. It's our responsibility to uh, call those kind of things in so that the appropriate departments are aware that, that there is uh, something out there that needs their immediate attention. And in the case of that microburst, the forestry was out there first call. First call, they were out there. And within a couple hours, it went from an obstacle course to a clean and open street because we have that, that kind of um, manpower and equipment available for any kind of situation within the city. So, so you're responsible for trees, you're responsible for garbage pickup, you're responsible for street sweeping, you're responsible for weed cutting, you're responsible for cleaning lots if somebody dumped or whatever the case may be. You're responsible for uh, encouraging folks to clean up in front of their businesses. You're responsible for if, if people uh, put a lot of garbage in their garbage can and it's overflowing, you have to get them tickets, right? So you right. have to write sanitation tickets. So tell us a little bit about some of those things. Sometimes we're the point person for the cleanup. If there's somebody that has overflowing garbage or there is somebody that, uh, you know, there is a business where their dumpster is not getting taken care of, then we're the point person. We're the one that's going to call the scavenger company and see why the, garbage, the dumpster wasn't cleaned. Or if it's overflowing garbage, we can try to talk to the owner, leave a warning. We could uh, let the district know to send a truck to pick up uh, the overflow or to make sure that the area is clean. But sometimes we're the, we're the person that brings in the other bureaus to do the cleanup. If you have a, a fly dump, and a fly dump is somebody who comes in the dead of night usually and, and uh, dumps a load of construction debris or they dump a load of some kind of refuge in an area that's vacant or an area where nobody's going to see them, and then all of a sudden you, you need to be able to clean it up. So we're the person that's going to reach out to the appropriate bureau to ask for assistance in getting that kind of cleanup. And, and many times it, it entails heavy equipment, having heavy equipment come in, a high lift a, a semi truck to pick up to pick up the load when the, uh, after the high lift gets done working. So there's a lot of different um, situations and it depends on what the situation is, whether we're the one that is directly responsible or we're the one that's trying to put together whoever we need in order to do a cleanup. So um, like right now we're doing a lot of street sweeping in summertime. So you have to have, so you have people on your crew uh, that have to go out and put the signs up before they sweep the streets. Right. And every once in a while people get a ticket and they say, no one has said anything about that sign. You know, we go through all of that kind of stuff. Why don't you explain a little bit about the street sweeping and, and uh, how, how it goes? We have two heavy seasons during street sweeping. Uh, here in the ward, there's 14, we have 14 sections. And that's how we do it. We sweep per section. And we're probably one of the wards that has the most sweeping sections. And that's only because geographically we're one of the largest. And so the way that it's worked out a few years ago, um, the Department of Streets and Sanitation decided to put the schedule and the map for the street sweeping online so that people, a lot of uh, people would have access to that information and they would know when their area was being swept. But technically we go out 24 hours in advance and the area is posted for street sweeping. But you have a lot of areas that are, are desperate for parking and maybe the residents would rather have a parking space than have a clean street. Hmm. So you always have to check that the signs are up because people will take the signs down. So people take the signs oh, down. Oh yeah, they take the signs down because they don't want to give up the uh, parking space. 
And the way, uh, usually it's two different departments that write the parking tickets, revenue or finance with revenue, which is now part of finance. So you don't write the, the parking tickets? I try not to write parking tickets, to be honest with you, uh, because the people really get hysterical when they get a parking ticket. And there's a lot more going on. And um, I just really tried not to write parking tickets. I do write them, not as often as people would think, because you have someone from revenue slash finance that's assigned to the sweeping section. Every morning they get their assignment, they go online just like people do, they print the schedule, they know what section's being posted, they come out and they write tickets. And the police write tickets, especially on the east end of the ward. The police are very active with so writing tickets. So what do tickets. you consider the east end of the ward? East like, of Ashland? East, east, east of, of Western. East, east of Western. Of Western is the, the police are very aggressive with writing uh, parking tickets. And to be honest with you, that's the area that's more critical for parking, where you have a large industrial component and you have a large residential area, again, where people don't want to give up their parking and you space. you have the entertainment area with the United Center. Right, and uh, uh, luckily by the United Center, a lot of that's permanent, uh, no parking, so you don't run into that too much. And, and because of that, the area is always really clean because the uh, sweeper has clear access. But I'll give you an example. Just recently, Ohio Street between uh, Halstead and Milwaukee was posted for street sweeping. Not one car moved. Not one car Not moved? Not one car moved. Ohio and, between Milwaukee and Halston. Right. And so my sweeper driver is calling me up. He's going, Linda, not one car moved. I went out there and I wrote tickets. I, it had to be one of those instances where I wrote tickets. So then you're looking at the condition of the street. Was there a lot of, a lot of debris on the street? There was. There was like muddy leaves and uh, litter. Uh, people were cleaning their car. They would just leave the stuff uh, right there. So there was a lot of debris. So what I decided to do was do what we call a special posting where we put up uh, tow zone signs, no parking tow zone signs, and hopefully the people would pay a little bit more attention. We decided to post them on a Friday so that they would have all weekend to see the sign there and know that we were gonna come in on Monday to clean. Well, on Monday we went with the sweeper to clean the block and nobody moved again. So then you got to struggle with, with it. What, what do you do in that situation? I didn't want to write another set of tickets. I probably should have wrote another set of tickets, but you're really struggling with that. We, don't, we used to be able to bring in a tow truck and literally move the cars to clean. But again, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place because we're trying to do more with less. So yeah, we have some areas that have real challenges like that. But people expect them to be clean. So tell right. me this. Um, some people think that the city actually send people out and clean their sidewalks. Do we do that? We do. A, a business owner or a property owner is responsible for keeping the parkway clean uh, within the perimeter of so their property. So what's the parkway? The parkway is the sidewalk. It's the, sidewalk. And, it's the, si it's the, the end of the property line to the curve. To the That's curve. the parkway. So are they responsible for cutting that grass in front of the place? Absolutely. Absolutely. But they but people would say that that's not ours. That's the city's. Right. But the code, municipal code of the city of Chicago says it's the property owner's responsibility to maintain that and keep it free of business litter, keep it free of litter, uh, keep the weeds cut, whether if there's a tree pit in front of it, that kind of thing. And I think you're absolutely right. People are of the misconception that it's not their responsibility, but it absolutely so is. So what about with snow? What if snow is in front of folks' houses? or? Snow is a real challenge. So whose responsibility is that? Same, same. Same deal. It, two Even di though it's on the city side. Two walk. different sections of the municipal code, but the same deal. Pretty much the language is the same. They're responsible for removing all ice and snow from the sidewalk in front of their property. Again, whether it's a business that's uh, responsible for it or the property owner, the snow and the ice has to be removed. And that was a real challenge this last winter, especially because it was such a brutal winter. So tell us, um, with all the construction that's going on in our ward right now, we do have a couple of uh, things that happen, um, like some chain reactions. One, I know you have to make sure construction guys clean up behind themselves when they have muddy tires and things like that, right? And then two, uh, it, it tends to shake up these rat barrels uh, in, in the ground. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You have a, a lot of big construction projects going on in the ward right now and 
and most of the time when you have a project the size of some of the ones that you have, they have a sweeper on site uh, all the time, 24-7. So the sweeper, if they're hauling out, excavating, and they're hauling out you know, debris, it, and certainly with the rain in spring, there is a lot of mud piling up on the street. So it is their responsibility to t uh, keep it clean, and people will call on that quite often. And then you'll go and tell them they got to keep it clean, or you'll give right. them a ticket? Right. And to be honest with you, I've never had a problem where somebody didn't comply. If you go out and you talk to them and you ask them, you know, this is something that you need to do, there's never been an instance that I could think of where someone didn't comply with that, that request. But the rat issue is a big challenge because it does, when you have new construction, that seems to be one of the offsets of it, is that um, people within the area of a construction site will tell you they're seeing a lot more rats. But there's only so many things that could be done about the rodent situation. If um, you have certain areas in the ward that don't have alleys, like the Old Town area doesn't have alleys. So if someone's doing construction over there and that kind of situation happens, it's hard to be able to get to the boroughs, so what I, the rat boroughs. So what I always tell people who call and complain about the rat situation, that when we put it in 311, that we should take their name and their phone number. And this way, rodent control will go on their property and check their property for the boroughs, and they'll bait the boroughs on the property. And they can only do this if they have a contact, because a lot of times, you know, it's locked, the gates are locked, or they don't have, uh, they won't be able to have access. So again, I think that you're limited sometimes, depending on what the area is, uh, when you have that situation. So, Linda, um, a couple of things changed uh, over the years uh, when the grid system. So give us an example of how things were before the grid and how things are for you. So like the community's expectations and what they were getting before the grid and then now uh, how different it is for you to for you to respond to things like that you used to do before the grid and now how different it is and, and I'm saying that because um, if I'm not mistaken uh, you had the whole staff here the truck drivers the laborers the clerks the RCC's you know you had the whole crew here and they were all up under you right right and so if, if you needed something special done, a special, which is like go pick up this garbage over here, you had a crew to do that. Can you sort of explain how it is now uh, and, and give us an example of how it was before? Because when people call and expect the same thing or, or, or expect the expedience of how it was before when we can just call you and get it done, it was different because we had to go through different another type of channel in order to get it done. So can you explain that a little bit? I think maybe garbage was a little bit more personal, if that would be the right word for people to understand uh, before the grid, because I think that if there was a challenge, let's say somebody forgot to take their carts out, or somebody moved out, or or someone was cleaning their garage, and maybe they, you know, they needed to call you up and let you know that, you know, they needed an extra pickup. You could try to work that in because you had so many trucks allocated to the ward, and if one truck was going to finish a little early, you could get them over there to do those kind of specials. So, I don't say that you totally lost that ability with the grid. I just think that the burden now is a little bit more on us to try to coordinate that kind of pickup because with the grid, here's what happens. Two districts service the 27th Ward. Northwest, which is located on Ferdinand and Tripp, which is the west end of the ward, and North and Troop, which is located on North and Troop, which services the east end of the ward. And so those two grids, typically service our ward on Thursdays and Fridays. Strangely enough, both grids do the same day. So on Thursday and Friday, the whole ward is cleaned in re relation to garbage. So it's my job to drive through the alley and look for those things that typically uh, somebody would be calling me about so that I could be a step ahead of it, as opposed to them calling me the same, let's say they call me on Tuesday and say, there's this pile of garbage there that I need picked up. Uh, can you help me out? Or I forgot to take my carts out. Can you help me out? 
I'm driving through and trying to anticipate what's going to happen. I send a picture of whatever I find in the alley to the appropriate district and let them know hey, this is a special I need it taken care of or somebody fly dumped the couch over here I need it taken care of. Somebody dropped some tires in the alley I need to make sure the truck is taking care of it. I give them the route number, I give them the unit number and I take a picture of it and I let them know that I need it taken care of. And they take that information and they funnel it down to the RCC to make sure that the truck takes care of it when they're in the, uh, when they're in the alley. So what's changed about that is that if Mrs. Jones calls me up in the morning and tells me she um, didn't take her carts out yesterday, can I come back? I don't always have the leeway of sending somebody back the next day because the trucks are only in the ward on Thursday and Friday. And if she's calling me on Monday and telling me she didn't take her carts out on Friday, the trucks at Northwest are in the Harlem and Irving area. So that's a, you would lose an hour and something just in traveling time to try to get one of their trucks to come back to service a missed stop. And the same thing with uh, North and Troop. If I were to call them and tell them that, you know, uh, Ms. Jones forgot to take her car carts out and she's on, gr on Grand, and, uh, Grand and Armor. Their trucks are on the furthest northwest, uh, rather northeast end of the grid and I think that's like around uh, Wrigleyville in that area. So you, you don't have the option of having, losing that kind of traveling time to have a truck come all the way back. So yeah, you have to be on top of the manpower and equipment situation. You've got to work with the district to know when they have an opportunity to send you the equipment. So you have to try to work your requests in between everybody's manpower and equipment issues. So it does become a little bit more difficult. So how have snow changed with the grid system? Snow is not grid yet. Oh, it's not grid yet? They're okay. Talk they're talking about making snow grid and they're talking about making street sweeping grid, but snow is not, not grid. But snow did change for us. How did it change? And tell us how do snow normally work for you? For snow, we have six, six snow sections. Our wards divided into six snow sections. And again, we're one of the wards that has the most snow sections. Some wards only have three, some only have four, some only have five. We're one of the few that have six. And again, for the same reasons, geographically, we're really big. And the way it works is that, you know, depending on what the call is and how heavy the snow is, if it's a 25% program, we don't get called out. Only the lead men get what we call the lead men. They get called out and they're doing the bridges and decks and that kind of thing, you know, high critical areas. On a 50% program, what happens is they'll call us in after the main arterial streets so are So what do are, you mean, uh, what is a 50% program? So they have, we have six snow sections, so 50% program is 50% of what you're typically allocated. If you have six snow sections, you get six spreaders. So if on a 50% program... You get three? Three, but we're lucky we get four on a 50% program. And sometimes they, you have a 25%. And we don't get called out for that, and nobody's on the inside. They're only doing, again, overpasses, of which you have a lot because you got the Kennedy Expressway that goes through the ward and you got some part of the Eisenhower Expressway that goes through the ward. So they're doing those, the overpasses for the expressways, that kind of thing. So on a 50% program, I typically get four spreaders. And so each spreader gets two sections. And I'm lucky that I get one extra spreader and they're in the Randall Fulton Market area because that snow section is the biggest of all the snow sections. Mm -hmm. So. Once the main arterial streets are done, that's when we get allocated because it's the same drivers, the same equipment. So once the main, again, the main streets are done, we get those spreaders and they start doing the inside. We're typically out maybe between four or five hours to do a 50% program. If it's a really heavy snowfall, then they call a 100% program and they'll, we'll, then we'll get a spreader for each snow section. And there's six. And what's changed about that is where our spreaders come from. Some of the spreaders that were assigned to the 27th Ward used to come out of loop operations. They were the drivers that did Lakeshore Drive, that did the downtown area. 
but there was always kind of a lapse in time before we got them as opposed to other wards. Uh, so we always had to kind of wait because that area was really critical. So they changed it this year and our spreaders all come from North and Troop, our district office. So we get them on a more timely basis. We get them as soon as they call an inside program, typically we get the spreaders. So we're a little, a little bit more ahead of the game as opposed to before. The challenge is then now you'll have new drivers, so everybody's got to get used to the route, that kind of thing. But this has been a, this past winter has been a, bru a brutal winter. So they became novices the first snow program and pros by the first month because we had snow almost every single day. Yeah, so I know uh, in this last snowstorm, we had a challenge getting rid of the snow, right? Right, because there was no place to put it. Every, uh, I think that the biggest challenge for us is that people who uh, plow out their parking lots, they plow the snow onto the public way. And you have these giant mountains on all the corners which create blind spots. And you have businesses that open up after the plows have been out all night plowing and businesses open up and they plow and they shovel their snow and throw it back onto the street. So you, you have, a, because again, to some extent there is no place, but it is not it's against the code to take ice or snow and put it on the public way. Is that right? Absolutely. So when do we go inside? And inside means the side streets, right? Right. We don't go in until the main arterial streets are done. And there's not a science to it for us. I and mean, the we main can't arterial streets are like the main streets, right. the Chicago Avenues, the Grand Avenues, the Ashlands, Division, Division Halsted, Halsted, North Halsted. Avenue. Where right. all the traffic is. So when the uh, snow foremen that are out there with the plows are saying that it's wet, that's the terminology they use, that the street's running wet, that's when they're 100% satisfied that the main streets are, are cleared and open, that's when the plows are assigned to go in. So you can't send them in until you get the okay. Right. And we then don't. once they go in, then, then that's when the war soups come out. Right, and, 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 we're and direct them and make sure that they, uh, because some of these drivers may be permanent drivers, may be drivers who's been here before, some may be new drivers, and some may not know the little streets or the little areas um, that may be not be on the map, uh, seen on the map, right? Right, they have what they call a snow book, and the, uh, the snow book's located in every, every plow has a snow book. But what I do is I took the snow maps and I blew them up to like 11 by 18 because a lot of times the snow program's in the middle of the night and you, you don't want the driver to have to struggle to read the map. So my maps are really big, the streets are really clear and I highlight the areas that sometimes are missed because they're off the beaten path, so to speak. So we try to give them every tool that they need to do their job to, to the best of their ability and, and you, you hope for the best. And my job is to be out there checking all those spots that are typically missed or someone calling me up and saying, oh, you didn't plow my street. Well, I'm checking that street to make sure it's plowed. Mm -hmm. When people want to get service, who, where should they call? Who should they call? Should they call you? Should they call us? Should they call 311? Should they do all three of them? What do you prefer? What, what, is, what is most expedient for them? I think that I think it's a good thing that they have all those options right. because they can choose any one of those options and they're going to get the service that they're requesting. A lot of times people will, will call me up because I'm the one answering, always answering my phone and they'll say, Linda, you know, I've been trying to get this, this and this, can you help me out with it? And I'll put it in myself for them. I don't have any problem pu inputting uh, things into 311. Or they'll call the district office and they'll input to 311. Or they'll call your office and we'll put it into 311. All of those resources are going to get them what they need. And the way 311 works, for me, particularly um, sanitation, every morning I go into uh, the CSR system and I print my 311s and it tells me everything that I need to be looking at for that day and I resolve problems, that's what I do. I'll, I'll look at the 311s and I'll go out and start inspecting and whatever the situation is, whether it's a dumpster not being emptied, whether it's overflowing garbage, whether it's a move out, uh, someone got evicted and all their furniture is on the parkway, whether somebody cut up a tree and dumped it, whatever the situation is, I'm gonna resolve it. 
that's what comes my way. It's up to me to figure out how to resolve it, whether it's asking the district to make sure that the truck picks it up when uh, the alley serviced, whether it's going to the, uh, doing a high lift request and sending it into street operations and telling them this is a, a lot of stuff, it's too much for a truck, we need to have heavy equipment come in, whether it's going to the re-entry program, the people that run that program and asking it, it's a lot that somebody fly dumped in back of but it's not big enough for a high lift, uh, they come out and they clean it. Uh, recently we've had some challenges with uh, the weed trees that grow up on our lots. So a weed all of a sudden over the years turned into a tree and the foliage is uh, blocking a lot of the lot. So you're concerned for that, especially if it's near a school. So I had a request uh, for somebody just the other day for Bider School. There were some lots that the city owned across the street from Bider that were uh, creating hiding places for certain things. And so I sent in a request to the reentry program and asked them if they could send their team in. And they cut all the foliage along the fence lines, uh, the big weed trees. They cut it all down, put it in the back of the lot. Somebody comes to pick it up. So all of that's determined through 311. So if your office is putting in requests or uh, people are calling into 311 or if you, I'm putting in a request, it all comes to us in sanitation. and we figure out how to solve the problem. So what about holiday pickups? How do holiday pickups? Do, we, do you pick up garbage on holidays? We don't have as many holidays as the city has. The city has 16 holidays, I think. So Only 12 of those holidays are sa uh, sanitation holidays. So you all work on some holidays. Right, so we work on some holidays. But those, those holidays that everybody gets off, that the city gets off, then the other days of the week, we work 10 hour days in order to make up the eight hours that we lost on the holiday. So if the holiday's on a Monday, then garbage starts on Tuesday morning at six o'clock and we work 10 hours Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday until, catch up. until clean to because catch up. Because on the holidays, people throw out more garbage. <laughs> Typically the summer holidays that, that happens, but uh, it, it doesn't matter what holiday it is, you still have to make up that day. Garbage is 24-7 no matter what. Yeah, it's well, it's because they're home and they're creating more garbage. Instead of being at work and throwing the garbage at work, <laughs> they throw the garbage at home or school, right? So there's more garbage. Once springtime comes, we get more garbage. Okay. And those holidays that come like Memorial Day and July 4th and Labor Day. So you all are have really to work heavy. extra, extra right. on those days. Yeah, it doesn't matter what holiday. If uh, the city, if the whole city's off, we're working 10 hours each day to make up that time. So what happens um, between a city lot and a private lot if something's wrong on that lot? What's the procedures for dealing with that lot? Because sometimes people, uh, we're able to do more with our lots, with the city lots, than, right. and it takes us a little more time to do things with privately owned lots. Can you explain to the public what's the procedures that we're dealing with a private lot compared to a, a public lot? You know, a city lot, it's not always easy to get a city lot cleaned up. If it's a big problem, strangely enough, it's easier to get it cleaned up than if it's just a small problem. If it's a big problem because you have all these other bureaus and all these other uh, programs that can assist you in, in a bigger cleanup, like again, the reentry program or the high lift, uh, that kind of thing. And the high lift is the big truck. Right, it's the big, big heavy equipment coming right. in. But if you have a lot that just needs, it, that just has litter and that kind of thing. Or do the weeds need to be cut? The weeds are really easy. Okay. If the weed needs to be cut on a city lot, I have a weed cutter, he cuts about 18 lots a day, that's the, go, you know, the average between 18 and 20. So getting the weeds cut is not a problem for a city lot or for a private lot. So do we cut the weeds on a, on a private lot? Right. We do? And this is why. I thought people had to cut their own weeds. I write them a ticket. So you write them a ticket. So what's this? tell us that procedure. So if somebody has a private lot and they're not cutting their weeds, they need to pay attention to that because that means if somebody calls and complains that that lot has tall weeds, I'm going out and I'm writing them a ticket. And it's a $600 fine for that weeds. $600. Weeds over 10 inches is $600. So the if first it's a, time. 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right. It actually may be more than that, the second and third time. So it's $600 for the weeds. Typically, they don't have a fence. It's another couple hundred dollars for not having a fence. They're required to have their name and uh, contact number on, on posted on the fence, another couple hundred dollars. They're required, if you own a vacant lot, to keep the lot maintained, another couple hundred dollars. So if somebody's calling me to a private lot, it's a, a, a little over $1,000 if I'm writing tickets. And then, yes, the city goes on if there's access and we, and we cut the lot. But the owner is getting $1,200 worth of fines for all the uh, violations that come along with uh, so owning a why, private lot. Is that why some private property owners have been calling my office asking me, do I know someone who wants to take their lots? <laughs> I think I think uh, that may be it. Cause it it's them. hard. It's hard to. It's not only as simple as having someone cut the weeds. Because if you don't have a fence, but then they, they sometimes people steal the fences. There was one property owner over there on California and Lake, and I'm not kidding. They stole his fence three times in a row. Stole his fence three times in a row. Three wrong. times within one season, and he had three different types of fence up. Is that right? The municipal code says non-combustible fence, which means, you know, chain link or wrought iron. Well, first he had a, a chain link fence up there. They stole it. Then he put the wrought iron post and he put the wood in between. And it looked really, really pretty, not necessarily adhering to the code, but it looked really pretty. It was gone within a couple of weeks. They came and they took the wrought iron post. Well, now he put a, the third fence is the chain link fence, and so far another chain link fence, and so far it's holding its own. So that that's a real challenge. That's a real challenge, and you see, you know, there's sort of this cottage industry that's been created uh, because of people buying metal and the price for metal being so high. Is you have people uh, scavengers that are making their living doing this kind and of thing. Those scavengers are the ones who also steal the garbage cans. Right? Oh God, yes. They still are garbage cans, and uh, and so what do people have to do to get a new garbage can? They have to call three one one, and Rodent controls the one that delivers the carts. So uh, you know, depending on what's going on, it may take a week to get a cart. It may take a little longer, but it is a real challenge. You have two scavenger yards in your wards. Every couple months we go and we pick up and they have like two and three hundred cards. So if you need a garbage up. can, you can just go to the scavenger <laughs> yard and get them because they yeah, be there, right? right. Isn't that crazy? Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Uh, but we can't catch the scavengers taking city stuff. And they, they, they steal things. Not only do they steal fences, sometimes they steal city light poles. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and, the, and it's almost them. amusing. Or sewer tops. That is a big thing, that they take the uh, yeah, iron grates that cover the, uh, the vaults. But we you can't know, catch them. Right. Right. But, you know, they're yeah. going to, it says City of Chicago on them when they're going to sell them, so. Yeah, so that's interesting. So um, you have to give them a ticket before you can cut the lot, or you cut the lot, right, then I give them a ticket? Right, I have to give them a ticket before I can cut it. So before you can cut it, you got to give them a ticket. So you can't just cut it right away. No. Can you clean it right away? A private lot or, or private a lot. city lot. Private. I I try not. I don't usually clean private so lots you get them unless tickets. there's extenuating circumstances. So you try to get the private owner to clean their own right. lot. So you get them tickets. Right. And then and you find them. That's the first warning. If they don't come and clean it, you give them a higher fine. They don't come, you give them another fine. Well, I don't. I don't determine the fines. The administrative hearing officer determines how they're going to be fined. Sometimes they consolidate the tickets. But here's the key for your vacant lots. If an owner has a fence up and has the owner's information posted on the fence, I'm never going to give them a ticket without gonna, calling them. You're going to call them first. I'm absolutely 100% going to call them first and tell them, look, the weeds are higher than 10 inches. You need to send somebody out. And strangely enough, every almost every time that works. Once in a while, it doesn't. But most of the time, it does. So here's one um, that's hot. It, it, and this one be, it, it, they speak about this at the CAPS meetings, everywhere. Dog poop. How do you deal with dog poop? If you got an owner of a property that's letting their dog out and not picking up the poop, and I could go to the house and see there's dog poop, one, I'm always going to leave them a, a warning and saying you need to clean up after your dog. 
If they don't clean up after their dog, you write the ticket just like you write any other ticket. And unfortunately, part of that is taking a picture of the dog poop because you got to prove that the, that's the violation. That's what the pictures that you take uh, support. The, uh, they evidence the violation that you're giving them the citation for. So what's the fine for dog poop? I think it's like $50 or $100. It's not, it's not a lot. And to be honest with you, I don't know, but I know it's not a lot. But if somebody's walking down the street with their dog and they don't have a bag with them, you know they're not going to clean up after their dog. There's not really too much I could do. What can I do about that? Because I'm not seeing their dog eliminate on the parkway and the owner not picking it up. And even if I did see the dog eliminate the owner not picking it up, do you think the owner's going to give me his driver's license <laughs> if I ask him so that I could write him a ticket? I so don't think so. It absolutely me, is a no, challenge. No, I've heard from um, rodent control that the rodents love dog poop. Oh, absolutely. We're feeding them. When they don't pick up uh, uh, what their pet eliminates, you're feeding the um, rats in the neighborhood. So the best way to keep rats out of your neighborhood is to keep your garbage cans closed, for one. Right. Make sure there's no holes in them and not have dog poop around, right? Yeah, so, and then somebody also told me that dog poop is a um, antidote for some of the rat poison. Have you heard that one? No, that, I think no, that's like a... That's a misnomer? Yeah, I think that's like a myth or something. It's a myth? <laughs> okay. Yeah, not, not at all, not mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you know what, um, again, Dog poo in some areas is a big challenge. Oh man, you yeah. have literally, literally some people, neighbors want to fight each other over dog poop. They call my office and you know, I mean, there's only so much I can do with dog poop. But another thing uh, that people call about a lot is trees, getting trees cut down. Can you tell me what's the procedure dealing with getting trees cut, you cut know, down? You know, the city loves trees. We love trees. We're a green city. We don't want to cut trees down. But if there's a, a diseased tree, and a lot of times you really don't know that until something happens, or there's something very noticeable about something being wrong with the tree, or if the tree's roots are going into your sewer system and you gotta know from the plumber saying the roots are going into the sewer system, then maybe the city, uh, the, you let the forestry know and they send out an inspector to check. They can tell you whether or not the tree is a viable tree or whether the tree's diseased and has to be cut down. So that kind of thing, the process itself is a little lengthy because you're getting the information, you have to send down an inspector, they have to look at the tree, tell you yes or, n yes or no, uh, whether or not there's an issue with it. A lot of times they think people come to see you about getting trees cut when the uh, roots are going into the sewer and, and system. And I think they only allow us to cut a couple of trees a year. It's got to be a really uh, serious reason to cut a tree. Again, because the trees are good for their environment for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've run in, I've seen some interesting things with trees. Um, I seen raccoons have babies inside yeah. the trees. That kind of, that was an eye awakener for me. And in fact, that was on uh, the 2900 block of Fulton, right. uh, where the, the they lived family. inside, right. Yeah. I've seen, um, I've seen, uh, again, some interesting things. I probably should. Fantastic, so tell us, uh, so during the, during the summer season and in, in spring, we have the cleaning greens and, um, you all used to have supplies here at your office. How does that work now? It's the same thing. If it's a small group doing the clean and green, I could. I have extra tools, uh, extra tools that, that we typically use: shovels, rakes, brooms. I can supply the tools and, to some extent, the bags. Small if, groups. Small groups. Like if it's only going to be ten people or something like that. But if you so, have a larger group, then you, either way, it should always be registered with three three one one. You should always register a cleanup with three one one. And when you register it, you ask them for the service request number. We call it an SR number. And it's that number that allows us to track, to track it uh, and make sure that the community group or the residents get their tools in their bags. And um, if it's a larger group, it's that SR number that allocates the equipment uh, to the community group. So what about um, graffiti? What's the deal with graffiti? You know, graffiti is really, really 
hard for us. And I remember when I first started, we rarely seen graffiti in the ward. Graffiti really would show up maybe every now and then on the east end of the ward, but you never, that was never a real issue for us. And now all of a sudden, it's like off the charts. You got uh, people hitting buildings in the Randall Fulton Market area. You got heat, uh, people hitting buildings in the River West area, and you're even seeing it more on the west end of the ward. And the challenge there is graffiti assigns equipment to the ward and they go to 311, just like I go to 311, and they print all the requests uh, for. Some people should call 311. People need to put the graffiti into the system. Every now and then I'll take some time and I'll go down, you know, a certain section and I'll put down all the uh, graffiti that I see and I'll put it in the system. But I think that a lot of times we just don't have that kind of extra time. So it's important if anybody who sees graffiti puts it in 311 and, and again, it's, it's uh, taken care of. And we get a, someone in the ward almost every week, but the volume is just off the top. So how do you deal with these abandoned buildings and if uh, folks dump in the, in the back of the house? Strangely enough, that's something that we could typically take care of in a timely manner. Almost in the same way we do a fly dump on a vacant lot. If you got an abandoned building or boarded up building in the rear, the building is open, meaning there's a parking pad there and there's where the uh, people dumped all the garbage, you write the property a ticket. In property like that, you write them a few tickets because there's a few violations that come into play. You take a picture of it, you send it into the high lift uh, crews and you ask for their assistance so in doing the cleanup. So how long do that take? A couple of days. So a couple, so it wouldn't happen right away, maybe a week, week the most? A week the most, within a couple of days, in, and if it's a serious situation where it's a hazard or it's blocking, if it's blocking the alley or it's blocking the street, that kind of thing, they, they come out right away. So how much would that cost somebody, uh, a ticket like that? It's not a separate ticket. It's the same kind of ticket. It's uh, an accumulation of garbage and trash, an accumulation of material and junk. Those are the two tickets. They typically start like at two, between 250 and $300 uh, for kind of buildings that where it's a little more serious what's being dumped. Mm -hmm. Then you could give it that it's conditions detrimental to the health of the, uh, the nearby residents. That's an additional citation that you could, you could write and that the building's not secure. So when you have boarded up buildings, typically they're foreclosures, the bank should have somebody to maintain them and they're not maintaining them. Then you figure out how many tickets you can give them to, make, to get their attention. So real quick, we got five minutes. This new blue car thing. How does that affect everything? You know, recycling's gone citywide. It, uh, now That's what people wanted. And, and people wanted it, but people aren't, not everybody not, is doing it. But the way the blue... Not everyone's doing it, now they're complaining about having too many garbage cans in the alleys. Because you have some areas of your ward that are really dense, tight, very dense, where it's, uh, where it's building on top of building. And unfortunately, a lot of it's the new construction. You've got new construction where they build property line to property line with no space for their carts. And then the city's servicing them, uh, and they have no place to put their garbage cart or their recycling cart, so they're throwing it up against somebody else's property. But the blue cart, and then it's hard to identify who's not recycling properly or who's not, um, if something is in the cart that doesn't belong there. But the blue card program is a good is a good program. You you again, it's one of those situations they where you want to do it. How often? Every other week. Every, Every other, other week. week. Part of the ward is serviced by uh, Streets and Sanitation. The Old Town area, everything east of the river is serviced by Streets and Sanitation. The rest of the ward is serviced by Waste Management. I got to tell you, if I had my choice, I would take Streets and Sands every day of the week. Because every time I've had, I, I've had less complaints about the east end of the ward that's serviced by Streets and Sand because they do such a good job. And a you lot can of times. too, right? And the thing is, the uh, waste management, I, I think that they were probably a little surprised about how difficult it was to do um, garbage collection on that big of an area. But if, like for us, where we work 10 hours on a, on a city day, they who have to work Two Saturday. Minutes. What can the community do to help you to keep the ward cleaner? 
I think they have to be very conscious of the, their surroundings. I think that we have big challenges with fly dumps. We have big challenges with foreclosures. And because of the boarded up properties, again, you deal with the same situation, fly dumps. Be aware of your surroundings. Trucks are coming in and dumping loads of material in your community. Get their license plate. Get a description of the vehicle. Call it into 311. That's a police matter and something that everybody takes seriously. And they can take their trucks, right? Right. It, you lose your truck. If you get caught fly dumping, they confiscate your, your vehicle and it's a $2,000 ticket. So I say to everybody, if you have a request for services, call it into 311 because we will absolutely act on it. And be aware of your surroundings. You live in a community, you have a right to have a clean community. If you got a problem with something, call it in. And the thing is, with new construction going on, with all the new construction going on, people have to pay money to get rid of their garbage. So they'd rather just dump it somewhere and not pay the money. Oh, absolutely. And, and, they and, don't want to pay the fee. And so we, that's the pro and con of new construction. But uh, Linda, so if people wanted to contact you, uh, what would you advise folks to do if they, ha if they need service? What should they do? You know what? I'm one of those superintendents that doesn't have a problem with people who live in the community having my cell phone number. Yeah, you know, they can call me up on the telephone and tell me they have a concern if they think it's not being addressed through 311 or not being addressed through a different avenue. So I could give you the cell phone number. Give them the number that you want to give them. All right, it's 312-415-0541. That's my cell number. And I never turn the phone off, even when I'm, uh, even when I'm not working. I never turn the phone off. If somebody calls me, and many times, because I've been your ward soup for nine years, there's quite a few people who have my phone number. And you live they, in the ward, too, And right? I live in the ward. They call me on we Saturday. Want to tell they call. People. We don't want to tell people where you live, because now they got your phone number, and they're, they're going to have your address. <laughs> Too. Yeah, so they can call me. I'm, I'm available. I'm a ward superintendent that makes myself available. If I can help, I'm there. I'm there if I can help. Now, uh, and I know we're getting ready to go off, but there's different areas. So people, I know some some areas in in the, in the ward has like street operations that work from downtown, and they empty garbage all the time and sweep. That's right. in the, in a central area. Right. district that don't happen all over the ward unfortunately no right and that comes and that's not under you that's really downtown that's loop operation loop services operation. certain areas of the ward um, and they go as far south they go south they go north and they come west it's in the central area so that's a different situation and um, and that's where you have a lot of traffic and a lot of density at right they don't really come uh, west of Ashland we're trying yeah. to get them, to, trying come to, get them to come Ashland. west of Ashland, right? But yeah, they don't come west of Ashland, and it is loop operations. So they come in and they service the baskets. They do hand cleaning, you know, that kind of thing. So it is uh, fantastic. A, it is a good thing. All right, well, well Linda, I want to thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate all your help. Uh, you're my right hand on helping to keep the ward clean. Uh, and also uh, with your uh, experience and professionalism working with the law department, you're able to expedite a lot of other things that need to be done as far as writing the tickets, you know how to manage your staff, you know all of those things which is very helpful. It's not just a fact of making sure things get clean, but there's a lot of other work in your position. So we want to thank you very much uh, for all your services. I think they need to promote you in the department and make you something bigger. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> That's up to them. Uh, uh, and just like every alderman, we all think we had the best ward superintendent in but the city. But you do have the best ward I know, superintendent I know I do, I know, I know, I do, I know I do. But uh, we want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank you for watching Network 27. I'm Alderman Walter Burnett, signing off with your ward superintendent, Linda Delgado. God bless you. See you, see you next month. Hope to see you all at the annual Stay in School picnic. Thank you very much. Goodbye.